Okay. Right, Good so morning. Please. Welcome everyone to AAA Space Geek Speak, our Saturday get together, informal and formal. And today we have a pleasure of a speaker joining us from a Euro European side, and it's a Tom Sindercom. He is a flight dynamics engineer working at the European Space Operations Center, ESOC, located in Darmstadt, Germany. As a contractor with Telespazio Company, Ger Germany, he provides flight dynamics support for the European Space Agency's current and future deep space missions. Tom will be discussing his day-to-day -day activities, what it is like to work in operations at ESOC, and the need for great flight dynamics team when managing interplanetary spacecraft. Welcome, Tom, and thank you for being here. We are looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Solana. <laughs> Sorry, it's uh, great to meet you guys and a uh, pleasure to be here. I was saying before, I'm flattered you you got out of bed and are spending your Saturday morning here. So uh, now I'm just uh, interested to give a talk here about uh, what it's like on the other side of the pond from you guys in uh, operations and flight dynamics specifically. Um, so I've been, uh, I'll quickly introduce myself, I suppose. It's, um, my name's Tom Sindicum, uh lifelong space enthusiast. Uh, uh, I'm not that long in the operations side. The last three and a half years I've been out in, uh, in Germany now. Uh, originally I'm from the Southwest of the UK. So, just down here. Uh, I moved up to do a, a degree in my master's in maths uh, at the University of Warwick in the UK with a thesis more on dynamical systems and orbital mechanics. Uh, and then Warwick's up here. And now I've moved over for the last three and a half years to the operations center, the ESA, the ESA site in Germany. And um, yeah. This has been uh, where I've been, and it's it's quite interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm a contractor with Telespazio Germany, and um, I don't know how familiar people are with the, the the setup of ESA. So I'll just quickly start big with ESA, and then kind of work our way down to the the site, and then our department, and then our our sub team. Um, so ESA's quite a big organization overall. So the sites are all over Europe, and then we have this extra one down in French Guiana. So loosely speaking, um, we have in the south the more science and earth observation, so the data processing side of things, and then more north in uh, Central Europe or um, in Germany and the Netherlands is the, the engineering side of things. So running through quickly, in the UK we have Exat, which does telecommunications. In Spain, there's ESAC, which does science and science data processing. ESRIN is down in Italy. They do the um, Earth observation side of things. Uh, ESOC is where I am in Germany. We do operations. EAC is the astronaut center. That's also up in Germany, but in Cologne. Uh, so about two hours drive from here. And then the biggest site is esa Eztec, And this is in the Netherlands and where the engineering gets done. So this is where lots of integration happens, lots of testing happens. Uh, that's where you see all the hardware. Uh, and then on top of that, we have HQ, all the, the project management, the politics side, uh, equivalent to your Washington uh, setup, I think, is my understanding. And then there's a final site in Belgium, which has a tracking dish, Redu, and uh, some other things to do with security, cybersecurity, education, et cetera. So, this is the loose setup here, and then we have the European spaceport down in French Guiana, which currently isn't flying much, but uh, it's, uh, uh, yes, slightly further away. So focusing in now, if you were to show up in Germany uh, at Frankfurt Airport, just a short 45 minute drive away, um, you would come across ESOC and you would be greeted by our front gate which looks a bit like this. Um, we're this very, very distinctive light blue color, which uh, some people 
hate and some people love. Some people thought it was the insulation and they were going to put paint on top of it later. But uh, no, it, it is actually, it stayed that color the whole time. Um, and the site's not huge, but it's not tiny. We're on the edge of town. There's the building you just saw here in the center. There's another big blue building, other side of the street. And then we have a range of control rooms, um, operations rooms, offices, etc. So it there's no clean rooms is one thing to note. It's it's not a there's no hardware here. We are a totally operations site. Um, the closest we have is some engineering models, which um, yeah, we, we've got rooms dedicated to them to do the tests and ground tests on. But other than that, there's very little hardware. Um, overall, it's around 1,000 people, uh, 750 contractors, 250 working directly for ESA. Um, it is mostly contractors here. Um, it's, I'm also interested to know if that's the same in, in the US, but uh, that's the way it's been going more and more recently. Um, and there's not too much but with regards to antennas, but we do have this nice little uh, antenna at the back if it pops up. Um, so this is Smile One, and this is open to any CubeSat missions that want to use it. So they're trying to support at the moment a lot of academia, universities, and if anyone wants to come along, it's just a, a four meter dish or something on the car park at the back. Uh, this is probably the... Uh, the highlight piece, the, the cornerstone, the, the thing you come and take all the photos of if you're touring around. So this is the main control room. Um, they mainly do launches here, LEOPs, et cetera, but for most of the time it's pretty empty unless there's a simulation going on. So um, this is kind of the the, the highlight the, of, of the place and gives a, a feeling. So that's, we've now gone from... Uh, up at the ESA level, down to the ESOC level, and now one level lower is Flight Dynamics. So ESOC contains all the operations guys. So this is the backend software support, the mission management, the um, flight control teams that manage, manage the admissions. We have the network operations center and all these dishes um, are controlled from ESOC. And one department and the department I'm in is Flight Dynamics. So. We're lucky enough to have the, the big building by the entrance. So Flight Dynamics manages everything to do with the physical state of the spacecraft. Um, so it's where it is, where it's going, uh, the movement, the pointing. And we kind of give input to the other teams or mainly the flight control team so that they're able to take the best decisions possible. Um, we're, we're kind of a support team here for the spacecraft an in-between between the actual spacecraft and the flight control team that have to manage the activities on board. Um, if you look at this building by the entrance, this is the Flight Dynamics building. So if you arrive, we've got security in the main gate down here. Um, on ground floor, we have mission analysis. So these guys are the guys that design the missions, come up with the plans, the proposals, they come up with the reference trajectory, which the rest of the building then has to follow. Um, so they're really the mission designers working out where we're flying and coming up with these crazy suggestions with uh, different flybys and uh, different pointings, et cetera, et cetera. First floor is diverted, uh, devoted to Earth orbiters. Um, it's entirely the Earth observation section. Uh, so this is anything which orbits Earth. Um, I'll come back to this, why we make that distinction. Um, I'm on the second floor, uh, which is the science or interplanetary missions. These tend to be the very high budget flagship missions for which they want a lot more attention and detail paid to. So GFE, the Earth orbiters, uh, fly a lot more missions, uh, but generally the constraints and requirements on them are a lot less than our floor in science and interplanetary, where everything is just swamped with requirements and it's really limiting what you can do with the spacecraft because they contain such sensitive instrumentation and payloads on board. And on the top floor, we have GFF, which uh, no one actually, <laughs> I've spoken to almost everyone in the department now, no one can remember why the F is in uh, GFF, 
but it's uh we think it's function because these are the guys which provide the software support the infrastructure a mix of all of this and um it includes test and validation who also generate data check at every stage that all our inputs and outputs make sense uh and try and uh, yeah validate our data to ensure we don't make any mistakes here so this is the same diagram now but i've just uh i've got rid of the 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 ground floor and kind of rearranged it a bit so this is the subdivisions of our teams so first floor like i was saying uh gfe earth observation they split into two teams. There's an orbit determination and maneuver optimization team and an attitude monitoring and command generation team. Um, and these are the two big teams. On second floor, we break this down even further because once again, there's so many requirements and it's so mission specific. So we have an orbit determination team, a maneuver optimization team, and a team for attitude monitoring, which is mainly telemetry monitoring, and then a command generation team. So going through these, it's it's somewhat what it sounds like. I'm personally in orbit determination. We take the tracking data from the spacecraft and try and work out where the spacecraft is. We pass this on to maneuver optimization, which tries to save as much propellant and optimize our future maneuvers while keeping us on track. And then attitude monitoring monitors the telemetry, monitors any uh, disturbances at key events such as deployments or um, Generally, if they're sloshing of fuel, they're going to notice it. They're, they really keep a close eye on the telemetry coming from the spacecraft. And then command generation has to then work out what everyone wants to do with the spacecraft and turn this into a set of commands which doesn't violate any of our uh, spacecraft constraints. And in between this, we're constantly chatting with third floor, this GFF team. So after we do an orbit determination, we get it validated. This is kind of a sanity check to make sure everything works. After the maneuvers are optimized, the, the orbit gets validated. And at, at every stage, we're putting stuff through to check we're not breaking requirements, to check it makes sense. And we, this really helps to not make mistakes, which, which is what kills a lot of missions in operations. So when, when the budget squeezes, uh, what I've heard is that these guys are often come under a bit of uh tight scrutiny um but at the same time these guys are well bad operations or human error is what kills a lot of uh, space missions and so far we haven't or we haven't lost a mission at ESA due to operation error I believe this is what my boss said once and I'm just I should have fact checked this and I believed him on the spot but I'm pretty sure it's true okay Okay, so at least in deep space mission, I should say. So just a quick run through then. So we're now down to from ESA to ESOC to flight dynamics. And then within flight dynamics, this is what we actually do on a, a kind of weekly level or for each for each spacecraft now. This is what we call the flight dynamic cycle. Um, so we have the teams here, and this is how data flows in from the ground stations and out to the spacecraft. And it all starts with the ground station. So the ground station here, we have a rather large network called ESTRAC. Now, the ESA stations are the ones in blue, uh, Karuna and Redu, we don't use so much. Santa Maria as well is a bit smaller, but used for tracking for things coming over the Atlantic. Uh, the big deep space stations are these Sobreros, number four, Malague, number seven, and Nunosia, number five. And these are the big 32 meter dishes uh, that look a bit like ah, there you go, Sobreros, Nunosia, and Malague. So these are the big 32 meter dishes. And uh, this is where most of Europe's deep space tracking gets done. It is all augmented with the DSN. And there's a lot of cooperation goes on there so that the US also helps with the tracking. Um, there's also another ground station, Goonhilly in the UK, which uh, you're familiar with from the lunar landing, was the, the one tracking the, uh, the recent IM1 lunar landing. And um, there's been some other validations. We're now able to use Japanese stations. We're validated with Chinese stations, which is also interesting. 
There's some Indian stations come online. Uh, this has been an interesting process to get more and more stations online here. So we take in data in the orbit determination team into, or we take in tracking data from the ground stations. At the same time, the attitude monitoring team takes in the telemetry from the ground stations. Now, when I say tracking data, I mean range and Doppler data mostly. Uh, orbit determination is quite difficult in deep space. And this is again why we separated the first and second floor, because around Earth in orbit determination, you can use GPS. But when you're in deep space, this isn't an option. Uh, the, I think there's a bit of a discussion about whether you can use it at the moon still, but beyond further out at Mars, out at L2 or whatever, you, you don't have a chance to use GPS. So the tracking is still done using range and Doppler. So the distance from ground station to spacecraft, uh, you look at the signal time or the time taken for the signal to go there and back, and then you look at the Doppler shift on that signal. Um, so this is what we do in orbit determination. We have to work out where the spacecraft is and use that limited data to reconstruct the past trajectory and propagate it forward. We then pass this latest orbit estimate over to the maneuver optimization team. So now that we know where the spacecraft is, we go take this forward and then the maneuver optimization team says, okay, they compare it to the target trajectory and say, we should do a maneuver here, 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 and here in order to stay on track. And actually we could shift this maneuver forward by a week, this one back by a week. We could cancel the next one and do it later. Their job is to save as much fuel as possible and to, to be as uh, sensible and well, as optimal maneuver optimization. They then pass us back the, the latest orbit so propagated forward far into the future with all the new maneuvers in. We then generate products for the station. So this is AOS LOS times, uh, pointing files when it's above the horizon for station sh scheduling, all of this. Um, and then other things such as orb or distance to spacecraft so that they can choose their bit rates and the like. And uh, there's a whole range of different products and events which we then give back to the ground station based on this orbit. Um, we then also pass these events forward to the command generation team so that they know what to do with the spacecraft. Um, they need to know certain things like when we're going in and out of eclipses, occultations behind Mars for the Mars orbiters. So any kind of geometric event to do with the alignment of the planets, the spacecraft, etc. Will we create these and pass them on to other teams. Um, and then this I'm still less familiar with. These guys are down the other end of the corridor, but uh, this is where the commanding then happens for the spacecraft. So attitude chats with command and they decide based on uh, what the science team wants. The science team passes in requests and then there's a discussion about whether instruments need to be recalibrated, whether we can do things within certain constraints, discussion about what needs to be commanded. And then there's a whole discussion about what direction Attitude wants to take the spacecraft. Um, so Attitude might have a bunch of requirements saying we want to point here at this time because we want to recalibrate this sensor. Could the command generation team then takes in all these requests from the scientists as well, the SOC, Science Operations Center, uh, because the scientists want to point at a certain thing at a certain time. Um, and then they also take in requests from the flight control team saying that, oh, we would like to do this at this time. Oh, we would like to deploy this instrument here. We would like to test this transponder here, whatever they need. And command generation seems to turn into very much a managing of different requests and requirements while staying within the, 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 the limitations of the spacecraft constraints. And the ultimate output of this is that commands get fed back into the flight control team. And I've put this in white because this is kind of the output of a lot of the flight dynamics work. We end up with a set of commands which the flight control team can say, okay, they wanted this. We give the flight control team their commands. Everything's packaged up. Everything works. Everything's with the latest orbit, the latest maneuvers. All the sensors are calibrated. The scientists will be happy. The flight control team gets all that data. 
the scientists also then chat with the flight control team outside of us uh, and uh, work out any further things, small actions. I, I don't know that interaction so well, to be entirely honest. And then the flight control team sometimes just commands stuff without flight dynamics in the loop, which always uh, flight dynamics doesn't like so much because we're very careful getting everything validated, getting everything tested, um, working out our maneuver optimization. So if the flight control team then just uh, fires the engines for a second, well, it's it's put to waste a bit of the maneuver optimization work. But uh, so there's a there's a good bit of a uh, discussion and healthier tension in there as well. And at the end of this, this all gets sent off um, back to the spacecraft. So all the commands get packaged off, sent back and transmitted back to the spacecraft. And this is kind of the bread and butter of what happens in flight dynamics. So this is what we would call the flight dynamic cycle, the routine operations. So depending on the spacecraft, um, for certain spacecraft in deep space, this could be once a month. Um, with some smaller internal cycles weekly, um, such as maneuver re-optimization for the more active spacecraft or spacecraft in more active environments, such as the Mars orbiters. This happens weekly, just because with such a dynamic environment, there can be a lot of changes quite quick. Uh, and there's just different uh, requirements. So it really depends on the spacecraft how often the, these cycles happen. This is kind of the base. On, on top of these cycles, we have a few non-routine activities or, uh, that occur. So the main one is uh, launches here. Uh, obviously, launch, LEOP, commissioning, this falls totally outside of the flight dynamic cycle. Um, the stuff needs to be broken down, put on different timelines, way more calibrations to be done. It's, it's very much... Um, a different kind of well the structure is the same but it's all uh, a lot more intense gravity assists as well we have uh, a navigation campaign where we have flight dynamic cycles aligned with certain events such as the tcms or the the maneuvers uh, solar electric propulsion we can have spacecraft like bepi colombo will be on electric electric thrusters for weeks and this really affects at least on the orbit determination side how things are managed because we now have to start modeling constant accelerations, overperformances, underperformances. It's a whole, whole other thing to think around. And then just after you've done all your nice maneuver optimization and orbit determination, the spacecraft occasionally goes into safe mode and uh, you're forced to replan everything because that's caused a big delta V and uh, you have to totally recommand, reset everything, check out what, what's happened, what's going wrong. And uh, so that throws in the occasional uh, issue like uh mars express this year just before christmas uh decided to go into safe mode which uh much appreciated <laughs> um then on to maybe the most exciting upcoming events at least for flight dynamics uh in our interplanetary department um on august in august i think it's the 18th or 19th um we have the juice lunar earth gravity assist and this is uh going to be very exciting. So this is the, the first time that there's going to be a double flyby of both the moon and the earth in one go. So um, the idea is here we flick around the moon and then it sets us up to a day and a half later, uh, flick around to the other side of the earth. Um, so it's a bit of an S shape weaving between the moon and the earth here. And uh, it's just so happened that so JUICE, this Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is on the way to Jupiter. And the trajectory, it launched last April, and it's now going for this LEGA, this Lunar Earth flyby. We then have a Venus flyby next August, August 31st. And we have two more Earth flybys before it finally flicks off and out to Jupiter for arrival in, oh, is it 2030 or 2031? Um, I forget. But uh, yes, this lunar Earth uh, flyby was only going to happen uh, for a certain launch window. And it just so happened due to schedule delays and slips and replannings that we ended up in this uh, this one off event. So this this will be a world first, which is quite exciting to to work on a double gravity assist. 
Uh, this is followed soon after by Hera launching uh, early or mid October, October 10th, I think it is. Um, this is the follow up to the DART mission. So NASA launched DART, the double asteroid redirect test, I think it is, um, and smashed into uh, Diddy Morphus. Was it Diddy Moon? Diddy Main or Diddy Moon? Um, anyway, this binary asteroid system. And Hera is the European follow-up to go and now investigate this system and see how much see how much damage you did. Uh, but uh, yes, the idea is to characterize the the dynamics, see how much the orbit's changed by, see how much the period of the moon's changed by, and um, this will be really interesting. There's a main spacecraft with two cubesats, so the navigation is all going to be so main spacecraft, two cubesats. Uh, a secondary and a primary body. So we've got five different objects all spinning around, <laughs> trying to uh, navigate through this is going to be a nice challenge. So um, that's something to look forward to. So, and that's what we do to fly these missions. So that's, this is our domain. We currently have seven flying missions, um, two Mars orbiters, TGO and Mars Express. Uh, two are L2, Gaia and Euclid. Uh, solar orbiters trying to get high inclination with the sun. Juice is on the way to Jupiter and Bepi Columbo's off to Mercury. Um, that's the plan. Um, and then the only thing, I've got one more slide here and uh, I just thought it might be interesting to say what I actually did this week, which uh, uh, I I'm not quite sure what what everyone's background here is but um uh, maybe just to see what a week in uh my life is like uh this week was totally setting up for this juice um lager this double flyby so um monday i went through and checked what uh, mars express was up to and the orbit determination looked fine there was just one ground station delay value which uh jumped slightly and caused a bit of discussion but it seems to be software related or that there was a software update and it was expected. Um, and now in the second week of um, March, we're doing a big system test, a simulation of this juice flyby. So we've got a two week simulation there covering the whole navigation campaign from TCM minus four weeks and then jumping ahead a bit to the actual double flyby. So in order not to disturb the operational platform, we, we've made a copy of that, so I'm setting up the test account there. Um, so Tuesday, I kept up setting up this uh, operations test account. Um, test and validation will generate some fake simulated data for us to process as if we are really receiving stuff from a ground station. Um, Wednesday, we had a new software update installed on our um, operations platform. Unfortunately, this isn't backwards compatible, uh, so this caused a bit of a, a a bit of time, a couple of issues trying to then work out the update and updating configuration there. Um, there's also we found a bug with the setup required for this Lega. Um, Thursday then turned into resolving this bug and finding a workaround as well as a team meeting discussing this migration, which happened, the platform migration and the software migration. And then Friday, I was back on Mars Express, checking everything's normal, validating the workaround with test and validation, um, checking we get the same results. And there, there's still a, a slight difference between the generated fake tracking data and the, the, the data when I process it, it comes out as 750 nanoseconds, which, is quite large. Uh, one of our teams has missed a delay somewhere, like a ground station delay or a clock correction or something, or we're using different Earth rotation models, who knows. Um, and that, that's how my Monday is going to start, is uh, going back to test and validation TV and working out the, this difference. Um, so just in case you're interested what ac actually a week in my life looks like. <laughs> um, and that, that's all I have for you. I've got a couple of spare slides in case people wanted to chat more about the the details of orbit determination and uh, what, what we actually get up to there. But um, 
Uh, I'd rather, I think, open the floor up in case people wanted to ask questions and chat and I'd happily take some discussion and uh, see what what things stand out. Uh, thank you. Well, Tom, thanks so much. That was really exciting. And uh, yeah, I've interacted uh, a bit with Isa, and it's really great to to get all the details of what all you're doing there in Darmstadt nowadays. And I'm, I'm really glad you added the slide about what happened this week, because that really kind of tells us what, where you got your fingers in the pie. <laughs> oh, glad to hear. Yeah, glad to hear. It was interesting. It's, uh... yeah. So in, in the chat, there's a couple of questions. Um, do you know how much people work in the main control room, Esther is asking? Uh, so, so the main control room is, I think it's more often empty than not. So the main control room is kind of the centerpiece where the, they have all this space and it's almost the, the theater in a way. Um, off from the main control room in side rooms, there's uh the the kind of daily operations room so there's three different operations uh rooms which are all set up and they, they don't quite look as fancy but um they do all the daily operations so daily and routine operations aren't done from the main control room it's really just saved for launches and simulations so if there's a big event people will move across to the main control room so that everyone can focus there on the one event and that all the other missions aren't getting in the way and uh this kind of thing so uh if the, i'd say the main control room is used but it's not that common um i think we have four launches this year in deep space we only have one hera and uh there's three i think earth observation missions going up so for each of them they'll use it but um yeah beyond that okay yeah um i don't know if you can see the chat but um, i uh i can uh is this okay. so you can see what rock wrote i won't read it yes i'm just so how do you estimate the remaining uh, propellant reserve on board and thus remaining delta v do you keep subtracting the amount based on those launch configuration or do you have other methods to validate those estimates during the mission okay so this is a an interesting uh method this isn't actually managed Ooh. Uh, I don't uh, I don't want to say something incorrect here. So this would be managed, I believe, by a combination of the commanding team of the um, attitude monitoring team. But I think this is mostly on. Uh, no, I don't want to say mostly. It's split between the flight control team and flight dynamics. But this is not quite my domain um i don't know what methods they actually use to estimate onboard fuel um certainly on the orbit determination side we end up with a an input file with the history of the mass of the spacecraft and every time there's a maneuver uh this there is an estimate done about how much based on the the commanded delta v that the mass is going to change by and then it, it does keep going down each time um I don't know the details of how they do that calculation, but after maneuvers happen, they update every time the mass of the spacecraft. So uh, I, I can ask around and follow up if, uh, yeah, as if you'd like. I, I kind of knew that Rock would want to get into the details. And yeah, I'm thinking exactly. It, it depends on the spacecraft because some might have some baffles and tanks that affect, and others might have some during times of rotation. You can use some sensors to determine how much fuel is in your tanks and and various things. And then of course, for the electric space part, um, it's entirely different as far as your your fuel reserve, <laughs> because yeah, you that's the, true. the long, slow acceleration with the electric propulsion. And um, so- uh, Actually, there was a lot of discussion for Mars Express as well, because um, depending on which model they use, on some models, the remaining fuel on Mars Express is below the uncertainty. So every maneuver could be our last one is the uh, mm. is the thing. But um, that they've then refined that model based on Venus Express, which was uh, mm. an identical spacecraft bus, but went to Venus instead. And mm. um, based on the Venus Express data, I think 
Venus Express finished in maybe 2015, but um, something like that before my time, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. um, uh, based on the in-flight data there, they believe that actually now the Mars Express fuel is going to go out to 2034, 2036, something like this. And it's no longer become the limiting factor on the spacecraft. It's now the gyros instead. So uh, mm. based on the flight model or the flight experience from the identical bus, they were able to decide that it's no longer. A, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's always good to compare, as you say, when you have the same bus on a different spacecraft that's already flown. OK. And I see Mike Helton is asking about your hours. My hours. So. How many hours per day are required and which teams work more hours? Oh, this is difficult. So um, uh, I think different people. So I would start by saying that I don't know what it's like in the US, but we heard rumors that in the US, it's certainly a, a different work culture, let's say, um, to, to Europe. So most of us do stick. Um, I wouldn't say many of us work beyond 40 hour weeks which is what we're kind of contracted to do um so hours per day is pretty constant i would say that um yeah sometimes you do end up working a bit longer here and there if you've got deadlines coming up okay that's that's natural but um yeah it's it's pretty standard 40 hour a week for most people with the exception being spacecraft controllers which are on 24 hour uh, cycle or 24 hour shift work so oh, um, so you do have some folks working a 24 hour shift because i'm familiar with that with the russian control center kind of the the driver there was because a lot of the workers need to take public transportation so they couldn't uh, get off shift at 3 a.m because there was no bus to take them home and, and uh so that that was kind of a uh something new for american flight controllers to have people work in 24 but you you there in europe have some people working 24 when needed okay no there is I, I think now for the interplanetary missions they're not but for the earth observation missions they still have uh there's definitely still shift workers there the oh. other place as well as the spacecraft controllers is the um the network operation center so the the dish all the dishes all the s-track guys controlling the stations mm -hmm. there's always someone supporting there in case uh, there's an issue with the station setup or anything like yeah. that. So. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the way things have gone with the International Space Station is down to really low numbers of people at, at really quiet times. Of course, today with the connectivity, I, I know one friend, he was uh, uh, given permission to go off to uh, New York State and take his work computer and do some flight control things from there um, just to, to keep things going because, uh, yeah, they they make use of the fact that people can be remote and and look at data and make sure everything's on track and of course as usual when there's you know a, a real big issue they'll start calling people in or something like that but of course there's many many more hours of expected uh data coming down everything looks nominal but we still want some people to keep eyes on it and, and such so yeah flight controls changed with the times which is good uh i asked that question tom because uh I worked at, J at JPL in the early 1970s on the Mariner Mars 71 mission, oh, which wow. was to uh, orbit, uh, orbit Mars and uh, map the surface of Mars for the first time. And um, we had two spacecraft to do that, but uh, one of them, the first one blew up on the launch pad or shortly after launch. And then the, uh, so the second one had to be redesigned, the mission had to be redesigned so it would uh, do the work of both spacecraft to map the surface of Mars and do a lot of other science, like take pictures of Phobos and Deimos and so forth. And I was on the uh, science sequence design team. We had teams very similar to your teams, um, but the uh, the problem that we had was that we, we did all the preparation work and knew what we're going to do and who was going to do what and, and how long it would take and everything. And it all, all was very smooth as we were going to, to Mars. When we got to Mars, we started orbiting. We discovered that um, Mars, uh, uh, the spacecraft did not stop on the weekends so we can get some sleep, you know, and <laughs> it kept orbiting every day. And so we had to work every day. And we had a team of six people 
And uh, we thought we could handle everything, but we could not. We got behind and we had to work 12 hour days, sometimes 18 hour days. And so uh, we had to adjust our, our work schedule so we can cover all the science requirements on a daily basis and still uh, have a, a team that could, could, could function on, on a you know, day after day for a whole year. And uh, so we, we adjusted our daily schedules so that we would work uh, certain days. Uh, I think it was something like 12 hours on, 12 hours off for uh, uh, two weeks. And then we would have one week off to recuperate. <laughs> Uh, and then, then we would go back and have a, a two-week schedule again of 12-hour days, and the uh, upper upper management got caught got wind of this that we were taking weeks off, and that was not uh, vacation time. It was just we would uh, charge it to the time, so they were very uh, un unhappy with this and upset, and they commanded that we not take all that time off, and so. Uh, the supervisor, fortunately, could work with that person and, and the team to kind of adjust things. So we kept our same schedule, but we told the, the person, the high manager, that we were working a regular schedule. And so it was a it was really a challenge for a working hours, in other words. Uh, so that was that was one thing I remember about that mission. <laughs> uh, I'm not aware of anything similar here, but yeah, I guess that must have been there. Uh... I guess different times it's uh, just uh, wow I guess you weren't sure what to expect when you arrive at Mars and no one's done it before no so it's a yeah. it's a totally different uh different kind of uh exploring new territory also, also I, I worked on the uh, pioneer navigation team uh hmm. which was the first spacecraft to uh, go around Jupiter and then the pioneer 11 went on to Saturn so we did a flyby of Jupiter and I had my my job was to target uh, exactly where to go around Jupiter to get to Saturn, which was on the other side of the solar system. So we had the flyby um, activity going on there. And we did much the same thing you did in terms of uh, orbit determination, a maneuver activity, and then a, uh, a targeting activity, which was my job. But that, that uh, team was very uh, good because we had only about six people on that whole team. One person to do the maneuvers, one person to do targeting, and that was me, and then uh, three people to do uh, um, the uh, orbit determination, and then we had one uh, nav chief, and he had an, an assistant also, and so we had six or seven people, and uh, it worked out pretty well because we had uh, a good understanding, and the nice thing about a small group of people is that you can have uh, meetings almost every other hour to, to define who's doing what and what data is transferred to who and so forth. And so it was very good. Uh, as you add more people to your team, you have to plan a, a little different daily activities so that communication can run smoothly and you don't lose data. Uh, more people uh, adds more complexity in terms of handling information. <clears throat> so uh, that team worked very well uh, for, uh, for a small group of people. And we did two spacecraft. Uh, doing the flybys and doing an occultation of IO on the first one. And uh, it worked out pretty well because everything worked fine. And uh, we were we were lucky that um, everything worked OK that way. <laughs> uh, Sounds like that was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Exciting times. Yeah. 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 Very good. I should, we, I should, have I should more, oh, we have one more question uh, from Erdem. And then I also have a couple to ask. Yes. Okay, so uh, I see, Ed, um, how accurate are the initial orbit calculations? How often corrections are required during missions? So th this is a slightly difficult question because it, it really depends on where your spacecraft is. Um, around Mars, for instance, you have really good resolution because you're next to a body, your velocity and position vector is, con or your velocity vector is constantly changing. So you can kind of, you can see the change and you have a lot more accuracy. Um, this means, I'd say, for Mars Express and TGO, our uh, TGO is exceptionally good. So I would say week on week, our estimates change by the order of meters, tens of meters between in the overlap. So if we have a data arc here and a data arc here, week on week, our prediction of where the spacecraft was 
So our uncertainty is somewhere around, yeah, let's say 10 meters in, in this order of magnitude. Um, meanwhile, our predictions one week out, when we then get the data the following week, we can be a couple of hundred meters, uh, a couple of kilometers off. Um, I'd say if we're uh, one, one or two kilometers is about normal, um, up to eight kilometers we've seen. Um, it's normally about a second or so phase drift in the orbit. Uh, and we have a requirement to remain within, ideally within 10 seconds, and we must be within 30 seconds phase. So week on week, it changes by about a second or two, unless there's been a big maneuver where it could be, uh, there could have been uncertainty there. Meanwhile, in deep space, um, it can go up very high to tens of kilometers, uh, maybe even a hundred kilometers, I think is solar orbiters uncertainty at the moment, um, because there's nothing else around. It's, um, and as a result, as there's no critical activity, we also get less tracking passes, less tracking passes means less, less precision, less data to work with. And, um, I think for the formal uncertainty of juice at the moment is about 10 kilometers, one Sigma. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of that order. Our velocity is quite good though. I think we're down to the couple of millimeters a second, maybe two millimeters a second uh, as of the moment. So, uh, and corrections, there's maneuver slots. Um, corrections aren't needed as much, as much as during a mission, you have wheel offloadings to desaturate the wheels. And these normally come with a residual delta V. So if you know your residual delta V, you can kind of um estimate and replan your wheel offloadings a bit to try and account for the phase shifts in the orbit uh or to try and put you back on track without needing to actually do a maneuver um so that this is what the maneuver optimization team does is they try and minimize the amount of um actual maneuvers which need to be done by instead replanning wheel offloading times and magnitudes um, and just have have the trajectory correct itself that way. Um, and Good then I see, yeah, mm -hmm. I see. Ah, oh, there's two from Rock as well. Okay, how do yeah. you estimate Earth traffic when you're coming in for Earth flyby? So, the Juice flyby is high. Fortunately, we're at seven thousand kilometers. Uh, we're we're not too concerned there. The really exciting, what exciting? Okay, it was exciting. Was um, Solar Orbiter came in for a flyby one or two years ago, which was at uh, four hundred kilometers, and that's I think it was the lowest or second, the second lowest Earth flyby ever, maybe. Um, based on my vague Wikipedia trawling through, <laughs> I was trying to get some stats on it, but uh, um, and this comes within Starlink because Starlink shells are up at four hundred and forty or something. Yeah, I was um, kind of wondering if you're going to be inside Geosync from what you just said. That one's way inside. You're down at yeah. Starlink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we, it was, but maybe I'm remembering wrong. Maybe it was 440 and we were under Starlink, which was at 470. Or, but I remember we were within one Starlink shell at least. Um, wow. And this was an interesting thing. So because we haven't had to encounter it before um, using space debris for these hyperbolic trajectories, which no one else really has on there their collision avoidance stuff. Um, so here the solution was three days before we produced an orbit with a maneuver going in each of the six directions. Uh, so one a long track, one back, and then each of the way. And we calculated, so seven different orbits in all, one doing nothing and one going in each of the six directions. And then um, at the very last minute decided which maneuver we were going to take, if any. Mm -hmm. um, so those, the space debris office checked out of all those um, trajectories, which one had the least chance. And uh, fortunately, they all had very small chance um, of collision. So no maneuver was done. But uh, it was the first time that in the interplanetary office, we needed to handle that at least. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting looking forward to seeing yeah. if uh, what that's <laughs> going to be like in future. Yeah, yeah. And and you talked about the combination lunar and Earth. I mean, that lunar orbit, we may start getting more traffic too. For yeah. 
<laughs> actually we do have a every day from jpl we get a mars uh madcap collision warning uh okay. so and mars so far <laughs> mars has traffic i think there's 11 11 active or 11 objects around something okay. like this um yeah. <laughs> including maybe the dead ones 12 somewhere between 10 and 14 uh, different trajectories are in the list and it compares them and sees any close approaches. So far, we haven't needed to do anything. Okay. Um, and I don't even know if we have a formal procedure for yeah. what happens if we do. But <laughs> Like on the screen in your car, you need to watch out for those red lines and, you know, take a, a route around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're near yeah. Mars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, something like that. We'll see. It's, uh, yeah. And there was also the one when I think the Bepi Colombo came for the Earth flyby and two days prior, there was a high altitude missile test. When I think the Chinese tested their yeah, space oh, defense. That might have been before my time, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm not familiar with. Yeah, I'm not working on Bepi so much, so I can't remember the flyby schedule. Was there one in 2020, maybe over Christmas? Or... Mm. <laughs> I can't recall. <laughs> I think so, yeah, but... Hey, Tom, so we this week we are celebrating Engineers Week. And so yes. in order to bring awareness and uh, the portray the need of uh, all the different engineering works, so specifically about your responsibilities, what skills and qualifications do you consider essential for someone aspiring to work in flight dynamics and uh, at, at the mission control center? I think this is an interesting question. And I would, I, I was thinking different things on different levels here, because I, I speak with a lot of students who have tons of motivation about space and really love space and space flight, et cetera. And what I keep telling them is don't just, it, it's great to love space, keep that enthusiasm, but get some great skills like you need to bring some skills to the table like it's so I, I love space but it's because I've done a, a maths degree and have a background in trajectory design and uh, this dynamical systems background that I'm able to contribute something to the industry um, and then I, I know lots of RF guys working in ground stations on radio frequency management and uh, all of this and they they're fantastic radio engineers who can do wonderful things, but also really love space. And it's that it almost doesn't, it doesn't matter so much in the technical roles, what skill you want to develop. It's more that if you think something's interesting, like electrical engineering, go for it. And you can work it out in the space industry because the, the, there's a need for tons of electrical engineers. If you like mechanical engineering, go for it, develop those skills and then come to the space industry. So. I keep telling people like, um, yeah, build, build great skills, software, hardware, whatever, and then bring them to the industry. Um, don't just uh, kind of rely on your love of space, uh, that, that they're not the same, that you, you've got to have a bit of both. Here. And um, so, yeah, my, my response for flight dynamics, it would be, yeah, trajectory design, get involved, competitions, learn software anything like this um but then generally in the space industry just pick something you enjoy doing any kind of engineering math science just go for it get involved throw yourself into cool projects and yeah you'll find your way so yeah and uh, addressing future trends in and technologies how do you see the field of flight dynamics evolving with advancement in technology and computational methods well, yeah, this is gonna. This is interesting because we constantly get told about AI in our department, mm -hmm. and uh, AI in operations is a is a hot topic which is very debated at the moment. So, I'm personally slightly um, hesitant about how transformational it's going to be in the hands on operations. Um, I think the more exciting technological advancements are just how uh, are more on the automation and software side so i mean we're still operating at isa in a very traditional way i suppose where like I, I showed the setup and all of this i can see in the future just because of how much quicker computers are and the way software's going 
that this, if, if I flick back to the flight dynamics cycle I showed, um, where this isn't done by people at all, and all this is done in software, um, and all we do is monitor the output. Um, so that rather than checking tracking data, seeing and discussing the result, everything gets done in one swoop. And then um, we're discussing outputs rather than actually taking every step, processing and checking. So I think computing power is getting so much better that we can run something and it doesn't take half a day Already our orbit determinations can take half an hour sometimes to go through all these iterations, all these all these processes. Um, and I think that's gonna get quicker and quicker and quicker to the point where rather than debating which number you should change, you you Monte Carlo it or whatever and put put in all the numbers, all the runs, all everything, and then see which looks looks most successful. And uh yeah. takes away some of the artistry in a way, but that that's maybe the future. Yeah. Speaking about Monte Carlo, uh, Rock had a question uh, that he posted about the validation maneuvers before uploading to the spacecraft. Are you using Digital Twin or uh, Monte Carlo as uh, simulations? And uh, so this is a kind of a bridging into the the Digital Twin overall discussion in the industry because, uh, especially with the something that what we're uh, with the efforts uh, gateway and uh, the operations on the lunar surface, not everything we can have in a physical environment on the ground. And uh, and for multiple reasons, uh, cost is one of the biggest ones. Uh, then because of that, a digital twin is becoming more and more promising as, a, as an option to run through various simulations and the uh, uh, verification of the very various scenarios. So how is it, how do you see in fly dynamics specifically? Hmm. Okay, there's a, yeah, a few parts to this. Um, so to to answer, I guess, the, the question Rock had first about um, the, the validating major maneuvers. So uh, I'm not quite sure here. So that there's a we simulate the maneuver and that there's a re-optimization done here um where they, they decide on the direction and the magnitude and it's assuming some uncertainty but it's not really a i mean there's just a massive optimizer there it's not really a digital twin or a monte carlo solution as far as i'm aware so it's just a um, different but, perhaps software package right or... Yeah, it's just an in-house software package for deciding the, the ideal maneuver um, or optimizing the magnitude directions, et cetera. Um, and then coming back to the larger digital twin discussion, um, yeah, I think this is this is interesting. Uh, I don't really, personally, I don't, may, maybe I'm just not a believer yet, but I don't see where the digital twin quite slots in with our work yet. Um, we're doing very, we're, we're already modeling the spacecraft, I suppose, in our in our different ways. We're, the The orbit determination team is modeling the, the the orbit of the spacecraft with certain parameters, with certain assumptions. Um, the attitude team monitor and we all have different models of the spacecraft. I guess we could all combine them into one kind of digital twin, but I don't really see that happening just yet. Um, but yeah, that's, I, hmm. the, the thing is that different people put different definition into and in the meaning into what digital twin is. Simulations are in a way, it, since you're not using the real physical artifacts, they are digital representation of the of the of the aircraft, and so that's to some degree that is a digital twin. Yeah, then the maybe we are already using digital twins, and I haven't realized it because we do have just, but we have massive configuration files setting up, but. These are very different from the flight control team who has access to the, the engineering model, or they also have a simulator. So every spacecraft does come with a simulator. So um, 
you've got the full range of things, but these are all very disconnected models. We we just model the dynamics, the 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 onboard software and hardware, or the onboard hardware guys have have all the hardware and electronics, and we don't really interact so much. So maybe that yeah. that was what I thought. Yeah. So yeah. if you're running only the simulations that are specific to your field, or do you run a combined integrated simulation of the whole spacecraft and all systems? For yes, at least that... for the major maneuvers. So I'd say, ah, okay. Then within flight dynamics for the major events such as LEOPS, and at least for this LEGA, we're we're doing a whole flight dynamics simulation, all as one, all common modeling. Um, on the day-to-day -day level, we do individual models, individual calculations. Um, only for launches does also the um, the flight control team and everyone get involved. And for a launch, it is a full simulation. Everything happens. Uh, the simulator gets pulled out and everyone is using the same simulation software. But that's a real, real special event uh, that has to happen there. Ellen has some questions, I guess. Yeah, Ellen has a question. Ellen? Yeah, I, I, I guess I could add to this. Um, uh, we were talking about what kinds of skills that you need to be successful at flight dynamics. And I have a quite a few years of flight dynamics experience. I've worked with flight dynamics teams almost my whole career. So I, I'm wondering if you find that, uh, like I do, that it's really helpful to have a good set of uh, gin and C and uh, physics skills, because I, I see that people with those skills tend to be tend to be successful. Uh, yes, I think that's a good. Yeah, I it really depends on the sub team, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree 100 percent. Having great GNC skills, having all of this. Um, is, is really important. And actually, when we come into it, uh, when when we're hired for the jobs, we often get put into a sub team which suits our background. So as I was on the orbit side, I ended up in the orbit determination team. Uh, there's guys that have done more um, software engineering, uh, more on the maneuver optimization team, for instance, uh, because they, they know the optimizers better. Uh, attitude and command. We've got guys from the aerospace background. We have guys there that have done GNC systems. So it, it, it yeah, I agree. Having a kind of physics intuition. So in flight dynamics, we are mostly aerospace engineers, mathematicians, and physicists. So we're, we're less engineers. Um, but saying that, we all are expected to have a good physics, physical intuition of what's happening on the spacecraft and the systems, etc. So yeah, I, I agree. It's really important to have that baseline. And um, your, your name is actually familiar. I don't know whether we've uh, uh, encountered each other in some, maybe we've been in the same team school before at some point, who knows, but. Uh, yeah, uh, it could be, you know, I'll look you up on LinkedIn and we'll see, we'll see what we have in common. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I wanted to thank you for all the the, the information that you have provided and uh, sharing your day of work, a day of in life of flight dynamics and cycle of the of the, the various activities that uh, happening uh, during your responsibilities fulfillment. That I wanted to ask uh, everyone that still remains on uh, in within the meeting. Do you have any other questions that Tom has not yet addressed? has not yet uh, answered during his presentation and answering questions. Okay, I oh, don't oh, hear. I, don't... I have, oh, okay, I have one other question. Um, when you're uh, working your uh, interplanetary missions to uh, Jupiter and, and uh, around the, the moon and everything, you take into account the solar uh, wind, the solar pressure on the spacecraft. Yes, uh, yes, we do a lot. Uh, this is uh, I've just finished writing a technical note about this actually um, about the um, the solar radiation pressure we we call it. It's a uh, yeah um, 
it, it's a very non-negligible amount and uh yeah. i've just finished writing quite a long document because it's uh larger than expected on juice uh it's a uh, yeah, actually, the, there's a model we get about the reflectivity of different uh, panels and components. So we get a big database with all the reflectivity coefficients of uh, the spacecraft. And um, we plug this in one of our models and we get a result out. And uh, in fact, uh, the observed estimates we're getting from flight are quite different to, to the model. Um, so... We're estimating along the main component, which is the sun to spacecraft direction. And this is about 3% smaller than expected, which, okay, that's fine. But the secondary component, because the panels are tilted at 70 degrees at the moment. So the sun's coming in and a lot's getting reflected, causing an acceleration this way. And um, this is actually 60% larger than modeled, um, which causes, I, uh, I'm trying to think of the number to hand. It's um, whatever... So the main component is three times 10 to the minus 11 kilometers a second. Uh, so I don't know what that is. Kilometers a second squared, sorry, acceleration. Um, so whatever 60% of, I know, sorry, that's the main component. Uh, and it's about 5% of that. So uh, anyway, I've made a promise never to do maths live on the spot to people. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's... Uh, Yes, it's a non-negligible and it's a really interesting discussion yeah. about because it's hard to estimate and is it some other effect or is it something else? But yeah, we do. Yeah. It's, it's the answer. Yeah. yeah. When I was on the mission, uh, Pioneer missions to Jupiter, it was a big difference. And uh, if you didn't take into account the solar wind or solar pressure on the spacecraft, uh, it would be a totally different trajectory going around Jupiter. And so we were very careful to make sure we had to include that uh, component on the way to Jupiter. So, well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Very good discussion yeah, and very good questions. paper. Very good uh, talk also. Interesting to hear from you too. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Thank you, Tom, for joining uh, us from Europe. wanted to mention that uh, in uh, March, we will have on March 23rd, We'll, we'll have a talk by Ron Creo uh, solving moon rover thermal engineering challenges. So if you're interested in uh, lunar exploration and specifically lunar uh, rover exploration by rover, please join us on March 23rd. You're welcome to join us every Saturday. We get together with uh, Probably a lesser crowd than uh, today, but still very interesting discussion of the latest uh, happening in uh, space exploration or in engineering field. And uh, we go from there, depending on who joins, we'll, we discuss different uh, questions, uh, different issues, and uh, find potentially solutions that we can recommend or think that would be better than what happened in re real life. And uh, it's always uh, easier to solve something in the hindsight. With this, again, thank you for joining everyone. I will post this recording uh, later on today on our uh, Space Geek Speak uh, channel on YouTube. And uh, always, you're welcome to join us next Saturday. Have a great weekend, everyone.